Well, hi, everyone, and welcome again to the Musical Inner Tube. I'm Don Rooney. To mark the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, we're going to present to you once again the conversation we had with Mike Hinkson. Mike is an old friend who survived the plane crash into Tower One that day. Mike has been blind since birth. He made the trek down 78 flights of stairs with his guide dog, Roselle, his co-worker, David Frank, and thousands of other office workers after the first plane put a hole in the building a few stories above his office. To mark this anniversary, we've lifted out the section where Mike talks with John Timpane about his experience on September 11th of 2001. It all begins in 1999, when Mike moved to New York to begin a new job with a tech company. But in 1999, I was recruited by Quantum Corporation in their um, magnetic tape drive division. That's the division that sold products to companies like Wall Street firms that would connect to their networks and back up all of their data. Um, and so we we had the de facto standards for that. And again, Quantum was told, if you really want to have a real presence here, you have to have an office. So I was hired to open an office and I went looking around and I had all these delusions of grandeur about we ought to do it in the World Trade Center and all that, but I figured it was going to be expensive and so I didn't go there first. I just looked around a bit. Eventually, I said, okay, I got to go check it out. So I went to the World Trade Center and talked to this guy who made a serious mistake in talking to me because he said, we only have about 80% occupancy because of the bombing that took place in 1993. Right. So we're really trying to get people. Bottom line is, by the time we finished negotiating, we got 1,400 square feet of office space on the 78th floor of the World Trade Center at $2 a square foot. Okay, now, Michael, yeah. that is amazing. Now, you have... <laughs> you can't get a house for that. <laughs> no, you can't. You really can't. My house, I won't let you live here for that. In fact, I wouldn't let you live here anyway. Well, oh, yeah, so it... But... Um, That's good, because so, I've, I've lived in New Jersey. It's... Uh, yeah, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> so, it's, it's just south of New York City, actually. So... Um, we lived in Westfield, and uh, yeah. we loved it. We yeah. Love anyway. So um, let's talk about the morning of September 11th, 2001, and you went to work with your guide dogs. So we opened the office in August of 2000, and it was a fully functional facility, alliteration, with um, staff that sold products, pre-sales engineers, sales support engineers, lots of products to demo for people and so on. And we, um, we were up and running. And in fact, we had a lot of reseller partners and we also had what, what are called distributors. So a distributor is a company that we work with. They would buy our products and they would resell them to little companies that couldn't necessarily establish credit accounts with bigger companies like Quantum. Uh, and it's not convenient for Quantum to have hundreds or thousands of little reseller accounts when you can just sell to one distributor and let them do it. And they actually established the accounts with all the little companies. So anyway, this one re, uh, this one distributor, Ingram Micro, wanted to have sales training for all of its reseller partners and our partners in the New York City area. So we set that up to do on, yep, September 11th, 2001. So I went, I went to work with my guide dog, Roselle, and we were in our office. Uh, some early arrivals had come from Ingram Micro, and a colleague from our corporate office, David Frank, was with me. He had come in that morning from California where his office was. He was part of corporate, so the ATL corporate offices were in Irvine, actually, on the UCI campus. <laughs> and um, That's so ironic. <laughs> yeah, I know, isn't it? So... We um, we were there. So David and I were in my office creating a list of the people who would be coming that day because there were two ways you could get into an office in the World Trade Center complex. Way one, you went to the desk, you showed your ID, they called up and they said, can uh, John Tipping come up and visit? And of course, we, we had a standing order that he could. But um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that was good sense. Thank you, Michael. But but what we but you could go and say I'm John Tabane and here's my ID and they would call up and we'd say sure send him up, or we could create a list of the people who we expected, which especially worked with large meetings and we had 50 people who were coming to different seminars in the course of the day. 
So David and I were creating the list. The list was done. I was reaching for stationery to print the list because it had to go in on corporate stationery and then we would fax it down. When we heard a muffled explosion, the building kind of shuddered and then it literally began to tip in one direction, kind of going southeast toward Tower 2. Um, David and I kind of wondered what was going on. We had early arrivals, as I said, who were in our conference room and they were having some breakfast that we had sent up had sent up to them and for all the other people who would be coming. David asked if it was an earthquake, and I said, no, I don't think so, because it's moving in one direction. And I said, it sounded like a little bit of an explosion, but he said, it wasn't a very loud explosion. Well, of course, it wasn't a loud explosion, because what happened was the airplane hit the building 18 floors above us on the other side of the building. So there's a lot of insulation between us and where the plane hit. But tall buildings like that are flexible, right? And so they're made to tip and be buffeted around in windstorms. And because one aircraft hit the Empire State Building in the 1940s, a military aircraft in a fog bank, they knew the value of having very flexible buildings. Picture it like a big spring, right? You fasten the spring to the table, to, to, to a table, hold the bottom of it, and then push the top of the spring. That's exactly what happened to Tower One. And did and, you did you personally feel the impact? Did it go through the floor? I'm oh yeah, wondering you could it. feel you could feel it shudder. You could feel it, and then we could feel the building tip. And in fact, we tipped so far, I say about twenty feet altogether, that David and I said goodbye to each other because we thought we were about to take a seventy eight four plunge to the street. Oh God! So oh. you had a, you had a moment of terror even then. Oh yeah, um, but then the building stopped. And it started moving back the other way. And I kind of remember letting out my breath. I didn't even know I was holding it, right? Yeah. But it went back to being vertical. And I went back into the office from, I was I was standing in the doorway to our outer office. Really a lot of good that would do if the building collapsed. But, you know, I grew up in Palmdale in the earthquake country. Building moves, go to door. Um, right. Roselle, my guide dog, was asleep under the desk. But as I went back in, she came out. I took her leash. I told her to come around and heel, which meant to come around me and sit on my left side, which she did. About the time she sat down, the building dropped straight down about six feet. That's because the expansion joints were going back to their normal configuration. Oh, yes. Right. Because to stretch, the the joints pay out a little bit. Right. right. All right. Okay. So, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say, you can see why Michael Hinkson was able to earn a master's in physics. He's extraordinarily good at explaining things like this. And this, this reminds me more of you than anything else. Uh, you know, just, you're, you know, extraordinary talent at being able to explain these things. Continue. Well, one of the things that I, I also need to say is being blind. I, and being the leader of that office, I felt it was my obligation to know anything and everything I could about the World Trade Center and where things were and so on. So I literally spent a lot of time early in our tenure at the center, learning where different places were, learning where the restaurants were, uh, even not going with a guide dog using a cane to travel around and learning where all the kiosks were in the middle of the floor that the dog would just go around, and learning all the emergency evacuation procedures from the Port Authority people and so on. Because I knew that if there were ever an emergency, the bottom line is, Sighted people, no offense, but sighted people don't pay attention to that. They figured we could look at the signs and it'll tell us where to go. Well, that works and doesn't. So it was important for me to know. So if there was smoke and people couldn't see signs, I was there. But um, the bottom line is that that also created for me a mindset of if there's an emergency, this is what you do. And, And literally every day I went into the complex, I kind of had a thought flash in front of me. If there's an emergency today, what will you do? Do you know everything that you need to know? And sometimes I discovered things I didn't know, and I would go find them out. So that literally on September 11th, the mindset kicked in. And after the building dropped about six feet, David looked out the window when he started shouting, Oh my God, Mike, there's fire and smoke above us. We got to get out of here right now. There are millions of pieces of burning paper falling outside our windows. And you could hear debris falling outside the window. And I was wondering what it was. Now I knew millions of pieces of burning paper, according to David. And he kept saying, we got to get out of here. And I kept saying, David, slow down. We'll get out. But no, we'll, we don't need to panic. No, we got to get out of here right now. The building's on fire. I can see the fire and smoke. And we got to get out of here. And I kept saying, slow down. 
Our guests began to scream and they were moving toward the exit. And then they heard me tell David, slow down. And eventually David used the big line. You don't understand. You can't see it. The problem wasn't what I didn't see and understand. The problem was what David didn't see and didn't understand. Sitting next to me was a guide dog who was wagging her tail and yawning and going, what woke me up? Now, John, you've been at the, you were, you were on a newspaper staff long enough, and I'm Don, I'm sure you have too. You've read stories about animals that sense danger and save their humans before the humans detected buildings on fire and all that. And Roselle was afraid of thunder, so I knew what she was like when she was fearful. She wasn't indicating any fear, which was another signal to me that whatever was going on wasn't so imminent for us that we couldn't try to evacuate in an orderly manner of some sort. Could have changed in a moment, but you got to go by the data that you have. And that was a piece of data that I had that David didn't. I finally got David to focus and said, get our guests to the stairs. So he took them to the stairs. And while he was gone, I called my wife, Karen, at home and said there had been an explosion or something at the complex and we were going to be uh, evacuating. So it was right now about 847. I think I still have the phone bill because I, I saw that time later when, when the phone bill came in um, to the company. But I, um, I told her, and, and I love to say this because it's really true, I scooped Good Morning America getting to her eight minutes before they got an idea that there was a problem at the World Trade Center. Nobody gives me a Pulitzer for that, so disappointed. <laughs> um, but, you get a but, nice round of applause today. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, we... You know, I, I told her, and so, of course, she then was watching TV, and at least it prepared her some when people started calling her, with Mike there and all that. So David came back. We swept the office. We went to the stairs, and we started down. And almost immediately, I began smelling an odor, and it took me about four floors to realize that it was something I smelled whenever I went to airports, and I did a lot of travel for the company with the fumes from burning jet fuel. And so I realized... Smell that when you were in the stairwell. Oh, yeah. Um, because the aircraft, when it hit the building, crashed through the center and literally blew a hole through the whole building, which was why David was seeing fire and smoke and millions of pieces of burning paper um, above him, right? Yeah, right. So, um, so I smelled that. And when I observed and realized what it was, I mentioned it to other people, David and others who were around us. Because we were all wondering what it was. I said, it's the fumes from burning jet fuel. And they went, oh, yeah, we couldn't figure it out. That's what it is. So we assumed we were hit by an airplane, but we had no idea as to why. Now, the press, the lovely press that we have, every time I've had interviews since, reporters say, or often they say, well, of course, you didn't know what happened because you couldn't see what occurred. And I said, wait a minute. The last time I checked, Superman was fictitious, and there is no such thing as X-ray vision. The airplane hit 18 floors above us on the other side of the building. I got to tell you, nobody where I was saw what happened, right? Um, and I said, look, the bottom line is I figured out that an airplane hit us before other people did on the stairs where we were. We had burn victims pass us going down. Um, you probably heard about a woman who was right in front of an elevator when a, a cloud of, of vapor, fuel vapor ignited and it burned her. And I think she was one of the ones who passed us. But um, we had burn victims pass us, and then a woman near us on the steps, the stairs stopped and said, I can't go on. And literally, we surrounded her and had a group hug and just said, come on, you can do it. Roselle was giving her kisses, and we were uh, able to keep her going down the stairs. You know, that's Meanwhile, so, a psychological moment for her or a physical moment that she just couldn't continue going down the stairs. Which oh, it was more psychological. And, um, and, so, and so to paint the picture, I mean- you are now physically going down the stairs step by step, one hand on the railing, one, one hand holding Roselle's leash. Well, part of the time I used the harness. If I was over on the right side, the rail was on the left. There wasn't a handrail on the right-hand side. But it, so if I could, I used the harness yes. uh, to let Roselle work. But if it was too crowded or whatever, then I would hold onto the rail. I'd move to the left side and hold the rail and just hold the leash. And were people, uh, people generally orderly as far as you could tell? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There were a couple of times that people started to, to lose it a bit, like at the 50th floor, David did. He suddenly said, Mike, we're going to die. We're not going to make it out of here. And of course, you know, as I said earlier, I took a, a 
I took the courses and got a secondary teaching credential. There's a secret course that they have for buddy teachers that they don't tell you about. It's the class is titled Yelling at Students 101. And uh, so <laughs> I had to. So um, not really a true class. But as soon as David said that, I just said in as sharp a voice as I could, stop it, David. If Roselle and I can go down these stairs, so can you. And he told me later that that brought him out of his funk. And uh, but he it's, wanted it's to really. Do... It's really too bad you didn't have a ruler to crack him on the knuckles with as well. <laughs> well, I was holding Roosevelt's harness, so I couldn't get to yeah, a ruler. Okay. Um, so I um, I I said that, and David then told me, you know, okay, I'm okay now. And what he wanted to do was something that would take his mind off of all of it. So he said, I'm going to walk a floor below you, and start shouting up to you everything that I see on the stairs. And I will tell you that I think that's one of the most incredible events that I experienced that day. So why? Well, we're going down the stairs. I'm on like the 49th floor now, and he's at 48. He's going, Mike, I'm at the 48th floor. Everything is good here. Going on down. I'm up on the 49th floor. Good girl, Roselle. Keep going forward and, and really encouraging her and speaking to let her know I was okay. Because if I started to sound nervous, she's going to be looking at me and not focusing as well as she should. So it was important for me to be calm and focus on her. That's the team effort that we both make and made uh, then that helped each other. But then I get to 48, David, 47th floor, all good here. So why do I think what David did was so great? Because in reality, he became a focal point for anyone who could hear him above him or below him. They would hear him, Mike, 46th floor, all is good here. And they knew somewhere on the stairs there was somebody who was sounding okay. And I know that he kept thousands of people calm just by doing what he did, which I think was really cool. And it's one of the most incredible experiences I had that day. It took me a while to figure out why I thought that was so important because did I need him to tell me what was going on? No, and it wouldn't make a difference to me, but it helped him. But more important, it really did help so many other people on the stairs who heard him, above him, below him, people who couldn't see him, but they all knew somewhere there's somebody who's doing okay. Now, Mike, how many people were on the stairs with you? Do you have an idea? Oh, no, I mean, they were all the way up and down the stairs, so there were thousands. Like right where we were, there was a knot of anywhere from 10 to 20 people, but they were all up and down the stairs. It was a constant stream of people. Um, do you, you, you know, that's a really good question Don asks, because I've often wondered, I mean, okay, so you kept calm and everything, but inside of you, I mean, you must have had all sorts of thoughts. <laughs> well, you know, I got to tell you, I was just listening for any creaking groan that would tell us that the building was going to come down on us, and I knew it wouldn't make a difference, but I was listening. Um <laughs> And, you know, I love science fiction. I watched The Twilight Zone and other shows, so I could imagine all sorts of horrible things that might be going on. But I also knew that I had to manage that. Um, and, and I'm just going to jump for a quick second. That has led to a coaching program that we just started called Blinded by Fear, because a lot of people have fear issues. Something happens to them, and they don't know how to control their fear, and they get so fearful that they can't... Um, make decisions because the fear has completely overtaken them. So I want to help people learn how to control those fears and not, and not to say, don't be afraid. I think fear is a very, very powerful and an invaluable thing to have, but you have to control it. So people can go to blindedbyfear.net and there's an ebook they can download and we can schedule calls and talk about it. So That's it's such a, a wonderful program. That's a, so it's a coaching program, and it's such a wonderful initiative, and I want to just repeat that, uh, blightedbyfear.net, dot net. And, uh, dot net, and that's that's for everyone. Well, I, it is. It's not blindness related. Um, I, I've been a public speaker for 19 years, so jumping ahead a little bit, afterward, people started hearing about me because um, Guide Dogs for the Blind was one of the first places I called since I had a guide dog from there, and they put out a story and contacted some news media, which led to me being on Larry King Live five times, the first time of which was on the 14th of September, right. three days later. And so the media got the story and people started contacting me saying, would you come and talk to our um, 
talk to our group or our company or whatever. The first call I got was from a pastor who was going to conduct an ecumenical church service to honor the people that we lost on September 11th. And he was doing, I think, two weeks after September 11th. So it would have been the 25th or the 26th. And I had not really been a public speaker, but I said, okay, sure, I would be happy to come and tell the story a little bit. He said, you got like about five or six minutes. And I kind of happened to ask, you know, do you expect very many people? And he said, yeah, we'll probably have about 6,000. <laughs> so my first public speech was to 6,000 people. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And Lisa, Lisa Beamer, whose husband Todd was on flight 93, he was the guy who said, let's roll. She was also there. And Roselle, helping you down. I, this is something else that you, you've worked extensively with guide dogs for the for the blind. Um, and you've said that Roselle wasn't leading you. A guide dog doesn't lead. The purpose of the dog is to make sure that we walk safely. The dog doesn't know where I want to go or how to get there. And in fact, I don't want the dog to know that. It was really a challenge working in the World Trade Center to try to find different ways to get from point A to point B so that Roselle would not and Liddy, uh, who also was my fourth guide dog who worked before Roselle, would not get in the habit of going one way um, because what if I couldn't go that way in an emergency? So I was very deliberate about finding various ways, even with just going a different direction around a central area to get back to the same place, but doing it in such a way that the dog would know where I wanted to go because their job is to make sure that we walk safely and that's it. Um, so if we're crossing a street, on the other hand, and suddenly the dog stops and pulls back, my job is to assume there's a reason for that, like a quiet car coming that I didn't hear, which is usually the case. Now, I also point out that working with a guide dog, it's all about developing a team. And it is a true team relationship in every sense of the word, like SEAL teams and any close-knit team. If it turns out that the dog was distracted and normally they're not because they're part of the reason they become guide dogs is they've demonstrated they can work without being distracted. But if a dog saw a duck and decided it wanted to go visit the duck, I guarantee you there'll be a team meeting and the team members will discuss the behavior of somebody who was not doing what they were supposed to do. <laughs> exactly. But, but you know, it, the, but that's all, it's called intelligent disobedience. The dog also has the authority and I need to respect it the authority to um, say that I got to do this and I have the obligation of following the dog because the odds are incredibly high that whatever the dog is doing, it's doing for a very legitimate reason. It's called intelligent disobedience. Interesting. Uh, was was the descent fairly, from the point of view of the guide dog and you, was it fairly smooth? It just... Yeah, you just it it was, and you know, but we worked, uh, and several of us worked to keep it um, smooth. There was one point on the stairs where people were getting real quiet, and it was like about fifteen floors after my um, discussion that I had with about David, and people were just getting real quiet. So I just said, I can't let these people be so quiet. So I just said to people, you know, look, um, we're not going to be able to come back into this building for a while, but what we ought to do is on our first day back, let's all meet on the 78th floor at 8.45 in the morning and walk down the stairs together. What a great way to lose weight, huh? <laughs> and and then another one that I did, also same principle and same issues, it was getting quiet. I said, as loud as I could, now everybody, I want you to listen to me. My name is Mike. I happen to be blind. I've got my guide dog here. And if we and we had power and lighting and all that on the stairs. And I said, if we lose power and lighting on the stairs, I don't want anyone to worry. Roselle and I are offering a half price special to get you out today only. And I did those kinds of things because I wanted people not to worry. Um, yes. You know, what, what are the flight attendants doing on airplanes when they're doing those pre-flight briefings? Well, if they're doing their jobs right, they're also really looking to see who's paying attention to those briefings because they've learned over the years that the people who really pay attention are probably the people who can help them if they need to get people to evacuate from an aircraft. Um do we know how many people made it down with you? How many people made it out of the buildings? Well, we we know that all the people who were with me made it out. The, only about 10% of the people who didn't make it out were below where the planes hit. Most of the people who didn't make it out were trapped above where the planes hit. So um, there were some stories of 
people who couldn't go down the stairs. There was a guy, a quadriplegic in a wheelchair, and there was somebody who was very obese, and they just couldn't walk down, and they they, they didn't make it out, and, and there were people who even stayed with them, things like that. But mostly everyone who didn't make it out were the people above where the planes hit. How long after you got out of the building uh, before the, the thing came down? So we got out. We got out. Well, no, we got out at about 1045, about uh, 10. Um, when did we get out? No, we, we started at 845, 850. We started down at about 935. We got to the bottom of the stairs, about another 10 minutes to go through the whole complex. So by 945, we were out. Tower 2 collapsed at like 1004, 1005. Um, and we were about 100 yards away. We, we knew there was fire in the tower, but we had no clue what was going on. No one told us. They just said, leave the area. So we went over to Broadway and started going north on Broadway. We were about Vesey Street. So what, about 100 yards airline ways from Tower 2 when it collapsed. So then everybody ran and we ran and ended up in a subway station. Um, then a police officer came at about probably 10, 15, 10, 20 and told us that the air was clearer up above and we needed to get out of there now. And so we left and went back upstairs and continued to walk away. Then it was about, what, 1030 or so when Tower 1 collapsed. Um, so we were a little bit a ways away from it. And so we didn't have the same issues that we did when we were so close to Tower 2 collapsing. How did Roselle do on the once we, you guys were outside and walking on the street? She did really well all day. Um, and in fact, when we got home that night, the first thing I did is I took her harness off and she ran to find her favorite tug toy and uh, our retired guide, Lenny, so they could start playing together. I mean, Roselle didn't even want to go out. She was too busy playing. Uh, eventually she went out, but you know, it was over for her because um, there was nothing that threatened her, but she was glad to be home and wanted to show it. I mean, in the years since you have used uh, your story as, as a way to talk about um uh, you know the role of the blind in in society, and and you know uh, how you were able to function, and in some ways uh, function better than those who had sight. It wasn't the fact that I didn't see that perhaps helped me focus. It was the fact that I learned to establish a mindset uh, that allowed me to use knowledge to be able to function rather than being afraid. It was something that evolved over time. So in 2010, a woman named Susie Flory called me who was writing a book on animals and on dogs and famous dog stories that wanted to include Roselle's. But when we spoke, she said, you ought to write your own book. And I said, I've been working toward it, but it's just not been coming together. And she offered to help. So the two of us collaborated. We worked with our agent, Chip McGregor, who is a very famous literary agent. And um, he sold the contract. And we wrote Thunderdog, the story of a blind man, the guide dog, and the triumph of trust at Ground Zero that was published in 2011. It was in its first week out a New York Times bestseller. It's been a number one New York Times bestseller. And then two years later, we wrote Running with Roselle, which is more for, for youth, uh, telling the story of Roselle and, um, and um, me growing up. Thunder Dog is great. Great story. Great books. I enjoyed it, reading it. Is, it is still very much out there, and, and Thunder Dog is available wherever you get books. It was published by Thomas Nelson Publishing, which is now part of HarperCollins. And Running with Rodell was self-published. It's um, on Amazon, and so people can go find one or both books. And being a poor starving author, we, we encourage people to go buy the book. And Audible has it, and all that sort of stuff, too. And thank you for listening to The Musical Inner Tube. Our lovely little podcast is available everywhere good podcasts are found. Listen on your favorite platform, and if you like what you hear, please give us a good rating. And spread the word. Tell your friends about The Inner Tube, and let them know they can subscribe to the podcast on our website, musicalinnertube.com. There you can listen to all of our podcasts, see pictures and biographies of our guests, and contact us. You can even click on the microphone button in the lower right corner to leave us a voicemail. And don't forget to leave your email address on our Talk to the Tube page so we can stay in touch. And you can email us directly at musicalinnertube at gmail.com. And as always, thanks to virtual band Car Radio Dog for our theme music. Music.